So welcome all to open access training session today. Uh, my name is Harri Ollikainen. I'm from the UniArts Library and uh, I'm going to talk to you about open access publishing quite in general terms. We'll get more in details with certain things. Uh, certain things we'll have to kind of uh, talk on a very general level. But uh, feel free to ask any questions if you have any. And uh, here's the agenda for today. We'll first talk a little bit about open science and how that relates to open access publishing. We'll talk about models of open access publishing, copyright, what are the benefits of publishing openly, uh, there are certain financial aspects to this, certain challenges and what's current, what current issues are there at the moment. And then finally, we'll take a closer look at UniArt's publishing policy and routes to, uh, how, well, how to publish open access at UniArt's. I'll, uh, Turn off my video during the presentation. If I know how, let's see, where is it? There we go. So this is the agenda. And uh, first of all, a little bit about open science, which is kind of an umbrella term. Well, here it's uh, defined as a movement which aims to promote open operations, models in science and research. And the definition may vary depending on who you ask. Uh, so it doesn't only refer to open access publishing. Uh, and of course, openness and transparency have always been part of responsible science and research and one of its core values. But certain current scientific practices in publishing, for example, are in conflict with the principles of open science and research. So hence all these different open <laughs> science uh, goals like open access, or we can talk about open educational resources or open data or open peer review and so on. And also there's some kind of a ethical side to this in open science. A closer look has been taken into the equity, diversity and inclusion in science and research. So that's for the background. And uh, some further background before we go on to open access, uh, I want to talk about the traditional publishing model and why things need to change. Because in kind of the traditional scholarly publishing, uh, well, first of all, the publisher usually owns the rights to the articles, which are published in expensive subscription journals. And people looking to read these articles encounter a paywall requiring them to pay a fee for access often something like 40 euros per article. And universities and libraries help provide access to such paywalled research by paying costly subscription fees. Uh, but this only applies to people inside universities and other people don't have access to them. And uh, what's more in the 21st century, online journal prices have gone up faster than the consumer price index while library budgets or university budgets for the journals have pretty much remained the same in part leading to something called a serials crisis meaning that universities have money to buy even fewer journals well international commercial publishers introduced something called a big deal model where they would sell journal bundles instead of single journals to universities 
effectively making single journal titles cheaper, but selling a lot of kind of unneeded journals at the same time. Uh, this is why UniArts Library, for example, has journals in chemistry and whatnot, because they sell them in bundles to us. So it's cheaper for us to accept all those titles as well. But the big deal model is no longer seen as a very good solution to this problem. And uh, one thing is that this kind of model of disseminating knowledge is still pretty much the same as it was in the print age, but in the digital era, it is kind of outdated. Furthermore, uh, when, when you think about research, it's mostly funded by taxpayers in the end. So researchers publish their findings in scientific journals for free, peer reviewers do their work for free, and in the end, the publishers sell the research back to universities as journals. And internationally, scientific publishing is estimated to be worth more than like $10 billion. And one of the problems here is that the journal market is a distorted market. There's a handful of for-profit companies who have an oligopoly leaving very few options for researchers and universities to choose from. And these big international for-profit publishers have kind of outrageous profit margins higher than uh, Google and Apple and so on. Uh, and the reason why the big publishers or why, why the publishing is so profitable is because the workers, researchers, and peer reviewers don't get paid. And finally, there's the question that should information be free? Uh, this image maybe clarifies the traditional model where researchers sign away their copyright to commercial publishers who sell journals back to universities. Of course, this is a generalized picture and there are all kinds of different models in the traditional publishing as well. So in traditional publishing, articles are published in expensive subscription journals that your university may or may not subscribe to. While in contrast, open access ensures that these scientific articles can be read and built upon by everyone. Uh, as an idea, uh, this predates uh, 21st century, but the first time kind of when open access was uh, introduced is in 2002 when the Budapest Open Access Initiative uh, was uh, introduced or published or released. And in that open access publication was defined that it's freely available for everyone without financial, legal, or technical barriers. And in open access publishing, the copyright to the work remains with the author who may grant different kinds of licenses to the work. And in terms of legality, ethics, and academic rigor, the author has to be properly cited and acknowledged in open access publications too. So just to dispel some kind of misunderstandings, you don't give away anything, but rather allow everyone to access your work and build upon it uh, for the greater benefit of all. So there are different ways of achieving open access, different models of open access publishing. Uh, gold open access refers to scientific journals that are fully open access. But there are always costs to publishing 
and a number of ways to cover these costs. And sometimes journals uh, achieve the, this by uh, charging the authors uh, something called an article processing charge. So this might seem weird that you should pay to publish your article rather than the other way around. But in the end, in the traditional publishing model, it's kind of always the institutions that pay for the subscriptions. And likewise, you don't personally have to pay the article processing charge. Rather, your institution or the funder covers it. And you make your article openly available to everyone. So don't pay uh, any APCs or any author facing charges from your own pocket. Turn to your institution or your research funder. But some open access journals cover their costs in some other way, like through a consortium model or scientific society fees uh, or whatever. And uh, they don't charge the authors or readers anything. And these journals are sometimes referred to as diamond open access journals. And uh, the DOAH, D-O-A-J database of open access journals actually has more diamond journals than gold open access journals. Uh, the journals published at UNIATS, TRIO and RUKU, for example, are both diamond open access journals. Then there's the green model, which is the way to make your article openly available, even when you have published it through the traditional model in a subscription journal. Because most publishers allow the authors to self-archive the, usually the final draft version of the article to a non-commercial or an institutional repository, such as Tayu at UniArts. Uh, sometimes the publisher allows this only after an embargo period. For example, 12 months after the article first appeared on the journal website. So the original article remains behind a paywall, but your final draft version is available for everyone to read and download from Tayu, for example. Uh, finally, there's uh, something called a hybrid model, which is not really an open access model, but it refers to subscription journals, which allow authors to pay for their individual articles to be opened for a fee, while the rest of the journal remains paywalled. So this might seem like a good idea, why not? But this leads to something called double dipping. Uh, in essence, the authors pay for their article to be opened, but at the same time, their institutions pay for this journal subscription. And essentially we're paying twice for the same article. And there are some other issues too. Uh, Kind of, if you think about the open access movement, which was meant to provide universal access to knowledge, uh, then the hybrid model kind of seems to defeat this point by hindering the discoverability of open access articles and creating more difficulties in disseminating knowledge. Uh, so here's a, a flow chart that explains open access publishing, uh, the traditional publishing model as well. Um, if you take a closer look at it, there's the, you start with your research manuscript and you submit it to a journal. Uh, the publisher, if they accept it, or reject it, or when they don't reject it, they accept it and uh, it goes through peer review. Uh, you get feedback and uh, do some revisions and 
you get accepted. The final, final version gets accepted. And depending on the journal, you either uh, sign away your copyright or, or give exclusive rights to the publisher. Or if it's an open access journal, you define the license with which you publish the article in the journal. And uh, after the peer review, you have your corrected manuscript, the final version or the author accepted manuscript. It has many names, but kind of the version of the article that is uh, the contents are final, but it doesn't yet have the journal layout. It doesn't have the journal logos and page numbers but the contents are the same. And this is the final draft version that publishers usually allow authors to self-archive in their institutional repository, for example. So here's the green model of open access. And this is where all the layout is done, where the uh, journal logos and other layout is, is done, resulting in something called a version of record, the final uh, publisher's PDF version. And in the traditional model, this uh, version of the article ends up behind a paywall in the journal or the journal website. But in open access, this final version gets published and sometimes it's through the diamond route where there are no author facing charges or sometimes in a gold open access journal when there are article processing charges and with hybrid open access journals there are always article processing charges involved and uh, Maybe worth mentioning that in the green model, uh, if you self-archive your final draft version of your article in a repository, uh, it's always free. There are no fees to be paid to the publisher. So maybe enough about the flowchart. So we've talked about uh, gold open access and green open access so far. And uh, there are some couple of slides that explain the differences from a certain point of view. In gold open access, for example, you as authors retain your copyright. You may have to pay an article processing judge but it's immediately openly available and it's licensed in a certain way. And uh, in essence, it's, it is very uh, efficient and uh, the dissemination is maximized and the social impact is, is high. Well, in green open access, you usually assign away your copyright or give exclusive rights to, pub to the publisher. Uh, sometimes there is an embargo period involved in, in uh, green open access, like I mentioned, but still the end result is the same. The search results become available to, to everyone. So <clears throat> what more benefits are there in publishing open access? Well, there are research results that have shown that open access articles get more visibility and are cited more often than paywall articles, which obviously makes sense. The more people who can read your work, the more likely it is that it gets cited. 
it's also easier to maybe reproduce other researchers findings depending on the field of science obviously uh, or you can just say that it's science done right as we discussed earlier about open science uh, and uh, the smaller universities or the global south often do not have the funds to subscribe to expensive scientific journals which leads to the question if the current state of affairs is leading to a widening gap between rich and poor institutions and uh, the traditional publishing model is very eurocentric and discussions about open access often cite global inequalities and structural issues as a moral reason to advance the open access model. And making research widely available obviously has a wider societal impact, not only to policy making, but also by enabling citizen science or in medical science, the benefits are more direct when healthcare professionals and patients alike can read the latest research. Not to mention the importance of having the latest research openly available during global pandemics such as COVID. And uh, <clears throat> something worth mentioning is the Ministry of Education and Culture's open access factor. Uh, open access articles bring 20% more funding to the university compared to a similar article behind a paywall. And obviously, this isn't, isn't something that individual researchers should worry about. Uh, but um, I just wanted to mention it here. So plenty of benefits. And these are not this is not a inclusive or conclusive list of the benefits. So we've already mentioned copyright. Uh, we're in the traditional publishing model. Authors often need to sign away the copyright to the publisher, meaning that you don't have the rights to upload your article to academic social media, for example, if it's published behind a paywall. So you can't take the PDF and, and uh, distribute it even yourself. But in open access publishing, you retain the copyright to your work and grant a license that allows others to share and reuse your work. And uh, the specific Creative Commons license, there are many different, uh, often depends on the publisher or the journal. So the journal already kind of dictates which license they use. So you might not, might not be able to, to choose it yourself. Uh, often the Creative Commons by license is seen as the best option because it allows others to reuse your work. But I again emphasize that the original author and their work has to be acknowledged and attributed correctly, uh, regardless of the license. Uh, these slides, for example, are licensed under a CC BY license. It was on the first, very first slide. That's a Creative Commons BY icon on the first slide, meaning that once I share these slides, everyone can take the slides, modify them, uh, distribute them, print them even if they want to, as long as they mention that these are my slides originally. So we've talked about money as well quite a bit. <clears throat> uh, so publishing always has some costs. The question is how much is kind of uh, accepted and who should pay for the, for, for the publishing? Uh, and it's become obvious that the big 
commercial publishers have also found a market in open access publishing in in uh, by publishing gold open access journals so they require the article processing charges or charge apcs uh, and the question is who's going to pay for it is it the author the funder the the university library uh, the government or everyone together you know, through a consortium of sorts um, maybe yeah talking about article processing challenges where the author pays for the uh, publishing costs well not the author themselves but the funder or the university uh it's again worth repeating that there are more open access journals who don't charge apcs than those that do but uh more articles get actually published in in gold open access journals so the volume is bigger even if the number of journals is bigger in diamond and the apc it can be like a, a couple of hundred euros or it can be thousands of euros and it changes quite a bit between publishers but it's uh, on average it's maybe two thousand euros if you have to give an average to this and the reason why commercial publishers have been keen in open access publishing is that they've found that the APCs are a substitute for the income that they have lost in subscription revenue. So there's a market for, for it, for, for profit companies so the funding model based on article processing charges which has merged kind of as the dominant funding model of international and especially commercial English language gold open access publishing you can argue that it jeopardizes uh the diversity, equity, and inclusion side of things, something we discussed uh, in the beginning. And uh, nonprofit scholar led publishers of journals and books in the various local and national languages across the world rely mainly on voluntary work of committed researchers and lack of sufficient resources they need to maintain the high standards of scholarly publishing and uh, therefore uh, one can argue that the diamond open access model needs a sustainable funding mechanism so that's what we kind of should be supporting instead of giving away our money, whether it's through subscriptions or APCs, maybe the diamond model is something that is worth uh, supporting and preserving. Because there is already enough money within journal publishing to allow for a transition to open access. And there are uh, regional differences in how open access publishing uh, or what's the dominant model. In Finland, for example, uh, open access journals are mostly run by not for profit scholarly societies. So, scholarly societies who don't have any commercial interests. To them, the transition from uh, subscription journals to open access publishing has been kind of 
uh, a no-brainer on an ideological level. But uh, the finance side of things is more tricky. Uh, <clears throat> the nonprofit or the journals published by these scholarly, si so scholarly societies um, are actually subsidized by the government, uh, but they still have to find uh, some revenue of their own. And these are often small journals who are run by volunteers, uh, researchers of that, that specific field. And uh, it's uh, quite, quite difficult at the moment for many journals, even though uh, most journals operating in Finland are open access already. Another challenge to this is the debate um, or, or, or how we emphasize and merit researchers when they publish in um, international journals. So do we value publishing in Finnish journals as much as we merit researchers in publishing in international journals? Tricky questions, and I don't have answers to them, but this is kind of the discussion that is often uh, taking place in Finland at the moment. Uh, there's a, a journal platform called journal.fi in Finland, uh, which is, I think, a great example of a nonprofit solution, which is uh, led by the academic community itself in disseminating scientific research results. So it's uh, maintained by the Federation of Learned Societies. Uh, it, it's in part funded by the Ministry of Education and Culture. Uh, and currently it hosts more than 100 Finnish open access journals. So maybe something like this is worth supporting instead of the gold open access journals of published by commercial companies. There are um, kind of many actors uh, who have a part in, in, in the world of scientific publishing, not only the researchers or, or the journals or publishers or the universities. But what about research funders? Well, they have actually kind of uh, realized this same situation that maybe the research results that they fund should be available to everyone instead of just those who might belong to a university who has a, who have a subscription to the journal. And there's a coalition S, which is a, an international coalition of research funders, and they have a, a, something called a plan S where they have outlined certain policies relating to publishing the research results. And uh, the Academy of Finland requires that scientific publications uh, that are the result of academy funded research projects are open access. And uh, the Academy doesn't, for example, allow publishing in hybrid journals in academy-funded projects anymore. So this is a requirement by a research funder, and uh, I think well, they have every right kind of to 
to require that. So they fund the research uh, and they expect the research results to be openly available. Uh, again, this is a, another uh, Finland specific thing. Um, there's a national coordination of open science. Uh, if you haven't heard about it, go to avontiede.fi uh, and see what, what it's about. Um, basically, it's an open coordination to everyone yeah. in the research community. So individual researchers can take part. Uh, there are all kinds of people there, university, from university rectors to researchers to librarians. Uh, and the coordination has produced uh, a number of uh, declarations and policies and, and recommendations, which research institutions take and implement locally in, in their own way. So, and this is, uh, I'm not sure if it's unique, but it's uh, at least very rare in, in the global context. So the academic community itself takes these goals and, and uh, tries to think what are the best ways of, of, of achieving them. Uh, one of the very topical questions is how do we support these uh, diamond open access journals published by Finnish scholarly societies? Well, not only in Finland, this is a question that gets asked in, in international discussions as well. But if there is enough money already in the system, uh, the question is where where should we direct it? And these are very very topical issues at the moment, or have been for for a number of years already. So we have researchers, publishers, universities, research funders. Uh, there are even more actors uh, who have a part in open access publishing, or at least they would like to have one. There's something called the, sometimes referred to as academic social media, which means uh, companies such as ResearchGate and Academia.edu. Uh, they are for-profit companies who, um, well, you're, you're probably more familiar with them as users than I am, but basically you can set up your author profile there and share your research there. Um, if you remember when I talked about the green open access model, uh, I mentioned that the publishers usually allow authors to self-archive the final draft version to a non-commercial repository. And uh, these are for-profit companies and of, uh, publishers often don't allow authors to share the PDFs of, of the articles in these uh, services. Something maybe worth keeping in mind and also they're for-profit companies and uh, you've heard the expression that if the service is free, then you are the product, which means that they're going, they are monetizing uh, your information somehow. If you don't you use them for free, then they're for-profit companies. Well, they're, they're, they're somehow monetizing it. Then there are, uh, and I like to talk about questionable publishers or questionable practices of publishers. 
instead of something that is often uh, called as predatory journals. You may have heard this uh, term before, but I like to talk about questionable publishers or questionable practices because some of the things that these so-called predatory journals are accused of, uh, sometimes even the traditional publishers uh, maybe fail in their editorial processes and end up doing the exact same things that these predatory journals do. And I don't want to downplay uh, predatory journals or publishers. Uh, I want to maybe point you to uh, a website called thinkcheck-submit.org. It's a kind of a Well, you can uh, look for certain things in a in a journal, see if it's okay, if you can publish there. Because there are a lot of uh, journals out there who send you, you may have received these emails from journals that you are not familiar with saying that, dear sir, Mr., Mrs., uh, whatever, often getting that wrong already, uh, saying that we, we have read your article, this and that, in the journal X, and uh, we would like to invite you to submit an article to our journal. And often the journal doesn't even operate in the same field as, as, as you are. And uh, kind of look for the red flags there. Is this a legitimate journal or not? Have you ever heard of them before? So all kinds of things to look out for. And these journals, well, they might have a legitimate looking uh, website. Everything looks fine. They claim to have uh, a journal impact factor and they claim to be indexed by databases. Well, in reality, they are not. In reality, they don't have peer review. Uh, the article probably gets published actually on the website, but it doesn't go through the peer review process or any editorial process, maybe not at all. Uh, and these journals are always operating on the gold open access model. So they take the APCs from you and then kind of do some lazy PDF and upload it to their website because it's not the scam isn't going to be very long if, if they're not going to publish anything. So they will publish your, your research results, but it's not going to go through a proper peer review or proper editorial process. But like I said, sometimes uh, legitimate journals also fail in, in what they're supposed to do. And uh, there's a website called Retraction Watch, which keeps eye on uh, research published in legitimate publication channels, but afterwards, after they've been published, something has been noticed that something is wrong with it. And uh, journals, sometimes have to retract articles uh, from their, well, yeah, they have to retract the articles. And this website kind of keeps an eye on, on that, what happens there and why this has happened. Uh, all kinds of online services and websites where you can get familiar with, with kind of the shady side of, of academic publishing. Uh, talking about shady, uh, this is some of, sometimes uh, jokingly referred to as pirate open access. Uh, I'm just going to mention the names and I'm going to provide any links uh, just to let you know that uh, these 
kind of databases or online portals or services exist. They are, uh, you can go there and download journal articles or academic books, which otherwise are behind a paywall or you have to buy them uh, as eBooks or something, but they host kind of pirated copies of journal articles and books, which kind of, well, you think, well, I, I, I need this article anyway, so what, what do I care? Well, I'm not going to cry over the, uh, the money that the for-profit companies are going to lose because someone uses these. But I just maybe want to talk about how these services uh, are not going to change anything. They're not the answer to the problem that we have with subscription journals. So they're not a solution to anything. Rather, they actually might prolong the current state of affairs. If enough many people think that, well, I can get this elsewhere anyway, I don't, I don't care, then nothing is probably going to change. <clears throat> So <clears throat> I think we've already discussed uh, some challenges relating to the open access publishing, but uh, I think the most relevant question is, is that what kind of system are we willing to support in the future? What is the future that we want? Do we want to support the for-profit companies by paying the article processing charges forever or maybe something else. Maybe the diamond open access model is, is more sustainable and more ethical. Uh, other thing that uh, makes things more complicated is how researchers are evaluated or merited. You often get, uh, it looks good in, in your academic CV that you have published in a prestigious journal somewhere instead of, a, let's say, a fairly new open access journal. And uh, who should be the pioneers in this? And I often tell, uh, especially those who are still uh, doing their PhD that I, I don't kind of want to uh, put the pressure on them because how researchers are evaluated and merited, it has bigger consequences to early career researchers than, than maybe uh, more experienced professors and so on. So the way research is evaluated is yet another uh, kind of factor to be weighed when we talk about open access publishing or how we should transition to open access. But this is a question I, I kind of like to ask that what's in a journal anyway? What is the added value of, of prestigious journals? Uh, are the editorial processes or the peer reviewers that they use, are they so much better than the ones that, open, let's say open access journals use? And this is, I know, an oversimplified question because uh, journals often function as um, <clears throat> maybe as platforms or forums for 
the academic community itself and uh, you know that there's one one or two central journals in your field and if you don't publish in those then your peers don't get to read your work because they only follow the few uh, the prestigious journals so <clears throat> It, it was maybe a bit generalized, but something uh, kind of worth thinking about anyway. And then finally, with uh, the way research is evaluated in Finland, uh, journal impact factors don't matter here, uh, at not, uh, not officially at least, but uh, there's something called a publication forum or Julkaisu Forumi, uh, which is an uh, kind of an index of of uh, scientific journals, which are placed on a certain level, depending on how good they are ranked. So it's a ranking system of scientific journals in Finland, and uh, the way it should be used, it's an instrument for uh, evaluating the research on an institutional level or even national level but it should it should never be used to evaluate individual researchers but i know that this happens even though it's not supposed to happen so we need a cultural change we need uh, a reform in in uh, scholarly assessment or the evaluation of research and researchers. Uh, a lot of things need to change. Uh, again, maybe the question is uh, from where it, it, it is going to change first or who is going to take the first step. Well, there are obviously been taking a lot of steps during the last 20 years, for example, but still many questions remain unanswered. And the way you can argue that, that uh, the gold open access journals or the APCs and the, how the for-profit companies have found a market in it, it's, it's exactly what they're supposed to do that's kind of capitalist logic. Markets will handle it and so on. And in a uh, neoliberal university, this might go unchallenged quite a lot. The problem with APCs is that we're actually moving, we're just moving the paywall if we had uh, access barrier, then now we have a participation barrier. So before, let's say smaller and uh, poorer institutions were unable to pay for the subscriptions and now they don't have money to pay the APCs. And this holds true within the global south, for example. So, and to further complicate things, there isn't just one, but many open access agendas. Or maybe the final, final idea is the same. More research results should be available to everyone. That's the goal. But how we get there, what are the models that we support uh, what compromises are we willing to make? Uh, these are the questions that there's no real consensus globally and within the research community or between publishers and so on. Uh, going back to the global south, uh, sometimes open access has open access as a movement or a goal has been accused of having kind of this post-colonialist agenda where the publishing model still remains Eurocentric and doesn't take different models in the global south into account. 
I mentioned Finland as an example where we have these nonprofit scholarly societies publishing diamond open access journals. But in fact, in Southern America, South America, for example, they've been doing that for years and they have a brilliant system going on there. It doesn't just get talked about very much. So I think that was the, on general level, about open access. A lot going on, different points of view, different actors, a lot of challenges and questions from different angles and so on. Uh, I have maybe the final slides uh, deal with UniArts more specifically. What's the state of open access at UniArts. Uh, well, first of all, the books, journals, and other publication series published by UniArts itself are mostly open access already. So we publish most of our uh, research openly, open access. There's only uh, some monographs or journals that are uh, for subscribers or you have to buy the book in print form or something like that. But most of the publications are, are already open access. But researchers at UNIOS publish elsewhere, obviously, as well. But still, 91% uh, of peer-reviewed scientific journal articles published in well, last year, were open access. Published in, in scientific journals or through UniArts publication channels, 91%. And that was the highest percentage between Finnish universities last year. And I think UniArts researchers can be proud of themselves regarding how things are at the moment at UniArts. Uh, something still gets published behind a paywall in subscription journals and so on. And I think that UniArts has taken uh, a big step forward um, in making <clears throat> self-archiving even more easier than it was previously and things got even more better last week when the new Chris uh, system was introduced so you can now self-archive at the same time when you report your publication just upload the pdf while you while you uh, report the publication And uh, quite recently, a new open access publishing policy was also introduced at UniArts. I can't remember the exact date, but it was in October. Uh, it has been signed and there's, there have been a couple of uh, events where this has been already discussed after, the, after it has been launched. Uh, the policy itself isn't even on the UNIATS website yet. It's so new. But it has 10 sections, and uh, I think we should maybe concentrate on a couple of things on, on the publishing policy. Well, first of all, uh, the number two, UniArts requires open access publishing when possible. So this is a big change to the previous uh, policy. Open access publishing is now a requirement. And of course, there's the when possible there that gives you some leeway. And it's, you can still publish behind a paywall if it's if there's no other way around it. Well, I've 
kind of been critical of the uh, APC model, but it's something that's uh, not going to go away very soon, or they're probably going to be there, well, for now at least. And uh, Uniance is going to pay the APC through a centralized APC fund. So you don't have to pay the APC yourself. You don't have to start looking for funding for it. Uniance has a specific fund for it. It has some criteria where you can use it. You can't use it in publishing in hybrid journals, for example, but other than that, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, we also recommend the use of Creative Commons licenses, which is pretty standard anyway if you publish in open access journals. Some funders have more uh, strict requirements in, in which license should be used. Uh, there's a recommendation that researchers register with uh, an ORCID identifier. Well, this kind of doesn't relate to open access publishing anymore, but I just wanted to mention it anyway. And another requirement is that researchers self-archive their scientific and peer-reviewed research publications when allowed by the publisher. So previously, this wasn't a requirement. You could do it if you wanted to, and sometimes we may be kind of approached individual researchers that, well, this seems interesting and it's behind a paywall, which you maybe want to upload the final draft version to Tayu. Well, now it's a requirement. So keep hold of the final draft of the author accepted manuscript when you submit your article or when you publish in a subscription journal. Uh, that way you can self-archive it in, in Tayu, maybe after an embargo period or sometimes not. And some other points there as well. And uh, the reason why this training session is given at all is number nine, <laughs> that training support and guidance is provided to open access publishing. So UniArts kind of has its requirements, but also gives support in all of this. But I think uh, the couple of requirements were the most central to this session and uh, uh, maybe just, just this slide to show you that kind of recap things and talk about the options that you have at UniArts in publishing open access. So we go back to the beginning where we discussed the different models of open access. First of all, you can publish in open access journals or publication channels. And if they uh, have APCs, if they are gold open access journals, you can apply for the APCs from the centralized fund at UniArts. Or if you publish in a subscription journal, you can self-archive your final draft version of the article in, in Tayu. You can do it in, uh, in the Chris system, or you, if it's, a, let's say, a, an older article, then you can just send it to the library via email. And uh, all in all, we check the publisher's policy anyway, so you don't have to worry about it. And uh, publishing in hybrid journals is still allowed. You can publish in hybrid journals. Just remember the double dipping and other issues that these journals have. And there's no centralized funding in publishing in these journals. So you have to look elsewhere. Or optionally, you can publish in these journals and just uh, opt out of the open access option that they have. So just 
leave it behind a paywall in the journal and self-archive it instead, and you don't have to pay anything. And uh, there's an online guide, uh, libguides.uniarts.fi, where you can find more information and guidance and the ABC funding uh, form is available there. This pretty much concludes my uh, presentation. There's some further reading if you're interested in the topic. Uh, and finally, we have plenty of time for questions and comments and feedback, but I mentioned in the beginning that you can save your questions afterwards when we stop the recording of this session. So I think I will stop the, stop the recording now and we can move on to questions after that. So thank you so far to everyone for coming to this session. So yeah, thanks. <laughs>